Uh, welcome everyone to PMZG Meetup, uh, I don't know, uh, 2017 April. Uh, please take this time to put your phone on silent. <laughs> and uh, today I'll be doing a talk on managing remote teams. Um, someone suggested that we extend Q&A from five minutes to 10 minutes. Is that something people would like? Yeah, no. okay. okay, we'll do that. No discussion. We can, we can do discussion. Um, also, uh, we have a Facebook account, so follow us there because we post very useful articles about being a better team leader, project manager, product manager. And also, we posted the video today from last month's meetup, so that featured Oradan giving a talk about Agile and Friends. Uh, so if you're not familiar with what Agile is, you can watch that video, it's on YouTube, and that was tweeted out on our Twitter account, which is PM Zagreb. So, I'll begin with managing remote teams. So first, I'm Steve Tauber. Uh, I have a company called Future Branch Development, and I also built a, uh, a mobile app called Cuddly, which is dating for geeks. Initially, it was just dating, and then market segmentation and stuff. So now it's dating for geeks. You can see it's got a nice bunny logo. This will be important later, so. Uh, so what is this talk about? It's about, uh, it's really just for tips to manage your remote team better, or if you work with remote employees, or maybe you are the remote employee. Uh, what this talk is not is how to actually do the communication, how to be empathetic, and things of that nature. So hopefully you can learn that from social skills somehow. Uh, so what's in it for me? Well, if you listen to my talk, you will make fewer mistakes, have happier people. How is this possible? We will find out with a little story. So again, remember I built this app called Cuddly. It's a dating app. And what does every dating app need? Well, you're gonna you know, send messages back and forth to the person you desire. And then you get to a point where you need to send them a really nice sticker or uh, emoji or something like that. So we had to build this sticker system into our system because we wanted people to be able to send cute little animal pictures back and forth very easily. Uh, so we did that, and we wanted to have a way that people could buy the sticker packs. So, of course, we're going to monetize this using in-app purchases, which are actually fairly complicated to implement if you've never done it before, mainly just because testing is really hard. So we're trying to build this system, we're trying to test it, so we decided we need to expand our team. We need to hire someone in order to just build this for us real fast. Okay? So we decided we're going to have an in-app currency, what should we call it? Well, remember our theme is bunnies, so of course, uh, so of course with bunnies you have carrots, carrots, carrots. And actually I think this bunny kind of looks like the one from Monty Python. I'm not sure, it's looks really evil. Uh, so we hired this Canadian guy, his name's Jeff, and he built it for us. So the problem is now we have a team that's spread out across Zagreb, Ottawa, and LA, and you can barely see, but there's only one spot where everything's green. We have one hour of the day, from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. in Zagreb, which is 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. in LA. So we don't really have a good opportunity to sync up with the entire team. So what are we gonna do? Uh, this, is, this is not an easy problem to solve, and as, as programmers, you know that uh, oftentimes our team is global, especially if people are doing digital nomad, maybe they're on a beach in Thailand somewhere. So, what can you do? How can you fix this? The first thing you can do is have stand-ups. As we learned from Karate <coughs> last month, a stand-up is a team meeting every day where you ask the same three questions <coughs> to your team. Usually this is done first thing in the morning. And those questions are, what did you do yesterday? So, what did you actually accomplish? during this time period. What will you do today? What is your plan for today? And are you blocked? And what this really means is, is something preventing you from doing your work? Now this is not a time to tell your boss what you're doing. This is a time to talk to all of your colleagues. And the reason is because what you plan to do might not be that important. Uh, maybe the best thing you can do is actually go make coffee for the senior dev on your team to get him going. Or maybe you need to work with one of your colleagues on another feature that's actually more important than what you plan to do. So it's really important that you are listening to all of your colleagues during this time in order to sync with them and have the best plan of action to complete your sprint. 
I invented something called the blackjack score. Uh, if you've played blackjack before, it's a way to actually count cards, and it's a running total of how many uh, certain types of cards you've seen, so you can guess at what the next cards will be. So uh, we implemented this at 3Coder, and essentially what it is is you can just say a score very quickly at the start of your part of the stand-up, and this will help your team focus in on what they need to hear. So if you've done everything as promised, you would say your score is zero. If you haven't done everything, it's negative one, and if you've done extra things, if you've actually accomplished extra stuff, then it's plus one extra cards, for instance. So you might start and say, okay, uh, yesterday my score is zero, uh, I did ABC, and today I'm gonna work on this. And so this can let people uh, really quickly tune in and hear just at a summary level before you start speaking about what you actually accomplished. Uh, one thing to warn you against is if you do decide to use this at your company, don't keep a running total of every single day because you might get the false sense that things every day, oh, I have plus one, plus one, I'm ahead of schedule. But maybe people are taking very easy cards and not doing hard work just so they get ahead. Um, maybe people are underbidding on what they can actually do. So we use this really as a way to determine do we need to put extra resources on the project? If at the end of the week, at a team level, we had a negative score, then then we were probably falling behind where we wanted to be. What time should you have your stand up? Well, in our case, we only had one option. It was 5 p.m. Uh, for the Zagreb people and 9 a.m. for the LA people. But for your team, uh, a different time might be available. Uh, many times, uh, teams have the stand up first thing in the morning. For us, that didn't work uh, at my other company because all the front end developers would always come in at 10 a.m. So we actually had to have stand up at the end of the day. And this actually worked a lot, a lot easier and a lot better. Uh, there are some tools that allow you to do asynchronous stand-ups, where you can get an email and you just reply in due time, or you can type into Slack. Uh, these can be helpful, but from experience, I've heard that people would either not reply in a certain amount of time, or you wouldn't get that face-to-face -face connection that you really need in order to make sure that communication is good. So. Uh, I've heard that they're not as good as actually doing the stand-up in person. I've always done them in person. So 7 plus or minus 2. Does anyone know what this is? Short-term memory. Short-term memory? No. It's the optimal team size. So 5 to 9 people. And the reason is because as you add team members, your team will grow geometrically. So with 5 people, you have... I can't see how many relationships. <laughs> You have 10 relationships with five people on a team, right? And with nine people, you have 36 relationships. And as soon as you get to 15 people, you have over 100 different relationships to manage. So this is why, this is one reason that the optimal team size is between five and nine. Um, so if you're, if you grow beyond this, you generally want to have multiple scrums set up, scrum of scrums. So you have multiple groups working on the same project. Oh, let's stop it. Okay, so that brings us to the second point, acknowledgement. Communication is just hard, and if your team and each person on your team acknowledges the fact that communication is hard, then you will get further with it. Uh, this is a quote, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it is taking place. This is by George Bernard Shaw. He's a playwright. He wrote Pygmalion. And I think, he, I, I think he's absolutely correct, and this is my highlight of the keyword, illusion, which is many people believe that they've communicated successfully when in fact they really haven't said anything or the person didn't understand what they were saying. So how can you avoid this? The first thing is use the phrase, my understanding is. By repeating back what you hear, you can find out ahead of time if you've made any assumptions about what you've heard, and you can also confirm with the person before you go on to say something else. So this is part of active listening and making sure that you're listening to comprehend rather than listening to respond. Read what you wrote whenever you're typing out messages via email or maybe in Slack. Before you press enter, actually read what you wrote. You'll be surprised at how many mistakes that you find. And consider questions. When you hit send, what is the first question that the person will ask you in response? 
Before I hit send, I reread what I wrote, and then I think about what question that person's gonna ask me. I try to tell the whole story in the first initial message, rather than send it, have them think about questions and reply. This takes a lot longer, and by painting the whole picture, I can facilitate communication. And of course, you can always use voice or video chat. Uh, beforehand, it was not very easy to do so. Of course, there's Skype, but now you have voice calling built right into Slack, so there's no reason not to use it. And another tip is work first, then personal. And what I mean by this is deal with work uh, topics when dealing with uh, remote employees before you move on to asking them about personal things. Because generally, when you come to someone and you say, oh, how was your weekend? How's it going? How are the kids? The whole time you're just thinking, what does this person want from me? Why, why are they buttering me up? So if you deal with work first and then do the personal stuff, you'll be able to bridge relationships much easier and you can build on that. So this moves us to our third point, quality versus quantity. So quality versus quantity, this is something that I think uh, has to come from almost the top level, but it can be pushed forward by employees. What I'm talking about is uh, how to measure work. So we have time tracking, it's part of our business. I think it's not inherently bad. Uh, for me, I think most companies time track for the wrong reasons though. So for me, the correct reason for tracking time is for, uh, is for validating estimates, making sure your estimates are correct. And if you're, if you're needing to bill someone, then that's another valid reason. But a lot of managers I found just want people in their chair for seven and a half hours a day and they don't care what you're doing. And this is really problematic and you see this a lot in other industries, not with programming only. Um, for instance, I know people that all they do all day long is browse Reddit and then they spend about two hours every week uh, fixing the one thing that they have to do each week. There's no, there's no reason for this. So uh, I think work really should be based on what you do rather than how long it takes for you to do it. And luckily with, uh, with programming, people are seeing this more and more and I think it's made it easier to say, look, these are the deliverables, here I've done them. As a contractor, it's very easy to bid based on project based, instead of based on time. So, uh, At Future Branch, we work six hours a day. Uh, I think anything after that, you're going to be checking in bugs for an hour and a half. So why, why undo what you've just done? So uh, this is something that I hope more companies start to do because uh, I think the quality will go up quite a bit when you're not fatigued at the end of the day trying to finish that one feature. Of course, code review also helps with the, the quality over quantity, and hopefully you're also doing some testing as well, which will keep that quality up. And another point is making sure that your culture uh, allows mistakes. People should not be fearful of mistakes. People should be willing to come forward and say that something is broken or that they've made a mistake and that they need help fixing it. And with remote employees, it can be very challenging to build this type of trust between the employee and the employer. Um, so it's something that you have to be aware of and make sure that uh, everyone is okay with mistakes being made. Now they shouldn't be made frequently. You need to identify them. You need to see patterns and where mistakes are made and then train to prevent them from happening in the future. The fourth and last point is the right stuff, meaning you have to have employees that are willing to communicate well. Netflix has a policy where managers think about cutting their team in half. If your boss came to you today and said, you need to fire half of the people on your team, immediately you think about a couple people that you definitely would get rid of and a couple people that you for sure would keep. What Netflix does is they ask this question almost every day. And this way their team is constantly improving. If you have someone that you would fight to save, you should give them a raise right now and promote them right now. If you have someone that you would fire in this situation, you should fire them right now because they're not helping your company. You can hire someone to replace them that is better. And this way they're constantly, constantly improving. Now with programming, it's very difficult to find the skill set that you need. It's very hard to hire people. So uh, one strategy is 
hiring for personality, hiring for potential, and then training skills. Another thing to consider is for each hire that you make, that person might eventually become a manager and they might move into a role where they are hiring. So if you have three levels, let's say A, B, and C for the quality of people, and you only hire people that are Bs, then those Bs will not hire As. They will hire people that are as good or worse than them because they won't be able to identify the talent. So whenever you're hiring someone, consider who would they hire? Do you want them making hiring decisions in your organization? Maybe not. Another point is understanding culture. So uh, in Europe, there are many cultures that coexist. And I think it's maybe a little bit easier to kind of think about where people are coming from, what their experiences are, where they live. Whereas in the US, it's maybe not so easy. So one thing to understand is that different cultures react in different ways to confrontation. Uh, different cultures react different ways to negotiation. So uh, here is a graph from the Harvard Business Review, and it is about different cultures, and you can see that all over the map, uh, different cultures are listed from confrontational to non-confrontational, and emotional mm -hmm. to unemotional. And so you have to understand the culture you're dealing with, because uh, if you're maybe working with someone in Saudi Arabia and they're yelling at you, uh, about some negotiation. It doesn't mean necessarily that they're mad at you. It could just be that that's the way the culture is. And so you have to understand who you're working with. By the way, my, my slides are online and uh, I have all the uh, sources listed, so. <laughs> um, so. So that's basically it in summary. So do stand-ups, actually talk to your team, meet with your team every day, including your remote employees. Make sure that you Acknowledge that communication is hard. Focus on quality instead of quantity of work. And make sure you have the right stuff, the right people in your organization. So everyone's going to go across the street and as they're walking across the street, they're going to call their remote employees and tell them they're doing a good job, right? Uh, so that's my talk. Uh, again, thank you. And please rate me on joined in so that I can do future talks. Have a good score there. I'm going to scan this with your QR codes in now. And then, yeah, that's it. Any questions? We have 10 minutes for questions, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I often do hear that, that they did the work as promised or extra work. That, that, that they did the work as promised or yeah. extra work? Yeah. Almost every day, the, the score is zero. It's People, I think, are fairly good at knowing what cards they complete, or what chunks of work they can complete on a daily level. Um, I would say that that's the most common, and then rarely is it I can complete something extra or I've, I've fallen behind. Um, usually the I've completed something extra is something that's just a small card that maybe took an extra, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, which is okay because it still needs to get done. Um, but yeah, usually it's usually people are fairly good at, at what's called bidding and saying, okay, I can complete these three cards today, and then they go and do them. Um, there's a there's a rule that says, for any given time, the amount of work will inflate to take up that time. So if you know you have six hours of work and you need to complete two things, it will take six hours. It won't take four, even though it could have, because you know you have six. So that's something you have to look out for. That's why you do estimates independent of determining who's going to work on what. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. When you say falling behind, falling behind what? Uh, so if you have a sprint and you have, let's say, 20 cards in the sprint, you might say, today I'm going to work on th these two cards. Uh, so at the end of the day, or the next day, if you're doing your sprints in the morning, you say, OK, yesterday I planned to work on these two cards. Did you complete them? No, I didn't. I've completed one card, and then the second card, I'm 80% done. Uh, so I have not completed everything that I promised. I've fallen behind. Don't, don't you get that on the team level from burn down and burn up chart? Uh, you do. What's the, what's the, what's the yeah, it, it's, it's the same, but it's during the stand-up where you can't really look at the burn down chart during the stand-up. I don't know if your organization does, but we don't. Um, but you can look at it, because if I, if I come the next day and I said, 
Okay, yesterday I worked on uh, the authentication for Facebook and I worked on the login uh, for email and password. And today I'm going to work on these three things. You don't know, you can't, maybe can't remember, or you don't know, did I say I was going to do a third card yesterday or was it just those two cards? You know? So it's kind of being explicit and saying, look, I said three things, but I only did two. I'm really sorry. Or I said four things and I only did one, maybe. You know? um, so it's just a more clear way to say, I didn't do everything I promised, or I did do everything I promised, I'm still on track. I guess. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Yeah. Do you have organizing issues then? Because that means that I just took two cards from the back of, or from the sprint to do, and yeah. nobody else can do. Uh, so, it depends on your, your scrum style. So with Kanban, you should only have one card at a time. Um, so then it's not a problem because you wouldn't actually take both cards. Uh, if you're working in a more agile, uh, true scrum, I guess, I don't know really what the term is, if you know. Probably. Yeah, but still the problem is that I have to remember what cards everybody else took. Not to take one of those. Yeah, a lot of people, I mean, people will call like dibs on cards that are advanced. If you're a senior dev, like there's certain cards you know you're going to work on, right? So that's usually the situation you're where you're not supposed to. I know people do that. So, and, uh, so let's put it this way. Let me flip this around. At the beginning of the day, during your stand up, do you stand up at the beginning of the day or the end of the day? Um, beginning of the Okay. So do you say, I plan to work on today? Do you only say one thing? Or do you say more than one thing? Uh, I, if I have a plan, I say what I plan to work on. Sometimes I say I'm going to do these things and then I'm going to call out if anybody needs help. Okay, so you're, you're working Kanban though, right? So you're, yeah. picking from, you're picking from the top. And you're, you're in traditional Scrum, let's call it. No, we just pick for whatever we want. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no ranking, there's no sorting. Idea is that you should pick from the top. Uh -huh, okay. If I feel more <laughs> so, comfortable with task on the bottom, I'm just going to take one on the bottom. So it's, it's Kanban-esque. But you have to you have to find sprint, right? Yeah. Okay, so at the beginning of the day, do you only say one card that you're going to work on, or do you say more than one? Usually one. Okay. It depends on the size, right? Yeah, it does. I mean, some people some people know, okay, I'm going to do these three cards today. Uh, this specifically happens during uh, maybe not, let's call it like, rolling maintenance, rolling uh, features, but if you have a specific dev project with specific feature set and you've taken that feature set, you've broken it down into scrums and those features will never change, this is like locked in, it's more traditional waterfall, you know what are the most important things to work on. So you know, okay, I'm gonna do this thing first, this thing second, this thing third. And so maybe that's where this is more useful. Uh, you know, yeah, we, yeah, don't, we don't take dips, so, because yeah. the point is that the cards are accomplished, especially in Scrum, the cards are accomplished by the team. Right. So you're, ideally you would be pairing on most of the tickets, so it doesn't make well, sense. Well, that's in Kanban, though. No, that's, Scrum means, or XP. If you want. Okay, sure, XP, sorry, yes. Um, that's what I meant. The point is that the team is accomplishing the tickets, so if it, right. it kind of breaks, so if whoever is finished first can take whatever, and then you'll join them and you'll resolve it together. Yeah, uh, so let's say, let's say you have a little, I guess, so on our team we always maybe look at, if you have one task that you know is not going to take longer than two hours, you probably should say there's a second thing you're going to work on today, right? Because you have another four hours to do something. Uh, I guess in your team you don't announce that. Is that one here? We might, we might. so for example, just today I said I'm going to do these things. And then depending on the time left, I'm going to call out to anyone needs help. Okay. I didn't call out of this. <laughs> <laughs> I had Did you call your remote employees and ask them if they need help? No, I didn't because I didn't have time to do that. Uh, because meetings popped up. Very were deciding to do it. <laughs> That's just how it is. So I'm going to report on it tomorrow morning. So you said, I'm going to do my task and then I will help people. Did you say yes. that? So then tomorrow, during your stand-up, you would be a negative one, because you didn't do the second thing you said. Yeah, okay, yeah, but I'm just going to say that. But it's okay. It's not a bad thing to be a negative one. It's, it, it's saying, I got blocked yesterday by something. You got blocked by meetings. And that's a really important thing for your product manager to know, is that when you get blocked, you have to be very vocal about it. 
And a lot of developers are really scared to say that, oh, I'm blocked, I'm totally blocked. I had to tell people, they'd say, oh yeah, uh, I, I'm working on this issue, but I can't do it because I need front end's help, but I'm not blocked. I'm like, no, you're totally blocked. That is the definition of being blocked. <laughs> say that to them, look at them right now and tell them that you're blocked. And it took a really long time to get people to do this. It's okay, and this is part of the culture of, the culture of failure, accepting that. Because uh, you, you cannot move forward, you cannot progress as a team unless you're acknowledging what your mistakes are and where your errors are. And it's very hard to do. It's very, I think, humbling. And I think people are very prideful often where they want to accomplish things without help. And you just have to suck it up. <laughs> so. Can you, can you share uh, experience about uh, in-app purchases? Why are they so difficult to test? Uh, like from a PA perspective. Yeah, so I actually was doing the back-end dev on that project, so I can maybe dive in from that side as well, but uh, for Google Play, um, this is like four years ago, this is how it was, uh, three years ago, so maybe it's changed by now. But basically you have, uh, you have their API that you're using, you have a PHP library that you're using, and you have certain accounts that are uh, approved for the test purchases. And you have to make the test purchase, then you actually have to go into the, the, the market, uh, what do they call it? Google, I don't know. Play. Google Play Market uh, Store or something like that, I don't know. And you have to cancel the purchase after you've done the test purchase. So that's one thing that's terrible. And the other thing is to evoke actual error messages is also not easy to do. It's very challenging to get it to do it correctly. So to test your failure cases is <laughs> not very fun. It's not very well documented, of course. So. But I think it's better now. Uh, so that was my experience with it. And no support. <laughs> and no support, no, no support, of course. Yeah. How do you manage if you had experience with escalations in remote teams? What do you mean by escalations? I mean, for example, if something happens, uh, it needs to be done immediately in Croatia, so mm -hmm. it's our time zone and your development team is in Australia and it's sleeping, or it's the other way around. Yeah. And uh, this occurs if you have a client that is really, you know, like pushing mm -hmm. for it. Yeah. Maybe it's not an escalation, but it's a pressing issue. How, yeah. how do you handle it? Uh, it has to be done now. Yeah, so uh, I used to work for Verizon and I was in charge of supervisor escalations actually. Uh, so I, like when you picked up the phone, I was like, my internet doesn't work, Don't give me your supervisor right now, and you got me. Uh, so that was my job. And I actually rewrote training for the entire company to de-escalate people. So the first thing is your PM should be very good at de-escalation. That's for sure, number one. But secondly, you, you should have contracts that support what happens in these situations. And I think that that's an area that's very weak in Croatia. In the US, it's extremely clearly defined because you're gonna get sued. <laughs> uh, but that's not a problem in Croatia. So, uh, <laughs> it's, I, I, I've, I've heard that it's basically impossible to sue. Uh, so what do you do? Well, uh, I, th I think you should believe. It's possible. <laughs> you should have very, I think, clearly defined uh, information about what happens if there's a critical bug after hours. What if it's not critical? What happens? Um, what if the server's down? What happens? What if you're losing money? What happens? Uh, and so if you set expectations ahead of time and communicate those effectively, this shouldn't really be a problem because you have an on-call number to call or you have a checklist to do the checklist. You know, the process is already defined. Uh, I know I didn't really answer your question, but uh, it should it shouldn't happen. Yeah, <laughs> maybe from your experience, oh, I guess. Yeah, I had so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I never had that problem really. I mean, I had outages after 5 p.m. and I just told the client, "Look, there's no developers here. It's you know, it's 5:01 on a Friday. Everyone left to the bar. You just have to call the phone number." And then it wasn't my problem anymore because there's some on-call guy and his job, he's paid extra money to, to pick up the phone and fix it. Mm. And so, I hope they did. <laughs> <laughs> roll back. Yeah, roll back. And additionally, um, for instance, I had a remote employee and we would Skype, like, sometimes we would Skype eight hours a day. Just 
have Skype going, you know? And we wouldn't be talking to each other, we would just be working. And some remote employees are okay with this and some aren't. Um, kind of the camaraderie, I think, is sometimes missing. Just the, you know when people are joking in the office, but if you're a remote employee and someone's saying something, you don't necessarily know if they're being sarcastic or they're being truthful. And so that can be a very fine line um, where people can get hurt feelings and you have to be aware of that. Just like any place on the internet, sending an email, same thing, you know. So, so much, uh, so much of our communication is done, you know, visually, non-verbally, through tone of voice, and you lose all of that on text. So, you just have to be aware of that and acknowledge that it's hard to do. Are there many situations where one team member is blocked by the another, which is in uh, another time zone, and mm -hmm. uh, his uh, working day is over? Uh, I luckily have never really run into it. Um, I used to work for a company and they had three dev teams, one in uh, Seattle, one in Singapore, and one in London. So it was eight hours, eight hours, eight hours. So there's 24 hour development going on. And it was done with extreme programming. And basically at 5 p.m. you've committed or you haven't committed. And there's no 5.01 p.m., too late. And if you break the build, like, that's the worst thing. So, um, I luckily was not a PM there. I was a trainer. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm really not too sure. I guess the biggest thing is just make sure you don't break the bill. <laughs> um, Do they uh, work uh, more than six hours then? Yeah, that was, that was I, I think they work seven hours. I'm not sure. That was like eight years ago though. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Don't, don't block people. Commit, I guess commit, I commit like 20 times a day when I'm programming. There's some people that don't do that, but you shouldn't, you should be committing as much as possible. Whenever you finish something, commit. So, even if it's mostly, if mostly there, commit. You have your own branch for a reason, you know? So, I add a comma, I commit. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. That's it.